<coughs> well, here we go, guys. Yeah. Um, how you feel, Zach? I feel I feel okay. I've just got a little bit of a cough. Zach's got a hot tea over there. Yeah. He's uh, he sounds horrible. He's I went got on a, a little run. A little illness going on right now. Sounds like. Yeah, I just went on a little run. You know, got the fresh air after sitting oh. inside for like two days, and you know, I guess it threw me off. I need to go outside more. Tomorrow. Hmm. Oh, it's a good day. going to be a good day tomorrow. We're heading over to Ted's in the morning to uh, do some shed hunting. And we're Ted gonna... Miller. Yes, Ted Miller. We're going to look for that buck. Uh, what, when was that? He, he got pictures of one of these bucks over his horizontal rubs. It was right after he shot that buck. I yeah, think. and this buck comes by the trail camera, actually after another buck. Mm -hmm. Or no, he comes, he comes by first. First. Mm -hmm on camera and then this other buck comes by and the thing's got like his guts hanging out of his mm -hmm. side like he's been gored or something and Ted wants there it is um, and Ted wants to uh, go and look for this thing tomorrow yeah. see if we can find it so that'd be kind of cool if mm -hmm. we could find that deer because I'm sure the thing is dead I mean it's got to be dead the yeah, footage is the just video. insane there's the video right there so for we're gonna do that tomorrow maybe explain what what we're talking about to people yeah like so everybody Instagram. that's tuning in on facebook live or, right now or either that or the itunes podcast or whatever right right yeah i guess wherever you're tuning into the hunting public podcast um we're working with some new software on this episode that allows us to incorporate more video and maps and images and stuff into our live podcasts into our video podcasts and the video podcasts there are on instagram facebook live and youtube in our in the the main focus right now is on Facebook is where you can view more of the you know video. Yeah, that's where you can that kind of. That's what the point of this software is, I right. guess. Is and do we plan on exporting that and then putting it on the YouTube yep. channel as well? It'll also so go on the YouTube channel there later. So, yeah, for anybody that's listening on uh, you know Podbean or iTunes, you can also go to the YouTube channel the hunting public or the you facebook can page. follow us on facebook at the hunting public and watch these live podcasts as they're recorded because they're they're going to be a little bit more interactive than just the audio version yeah. but on today's show we're gonna go into more of the mapping type strategy stuff we get questions on that all the time and it's it seems like uh it's hard for us to really dive in and explain what happened on a lot of these hunts without showing a map right without showing a map because there's a lot of there's a lot of things yeah there's a lot of things that we try to explain but it's hard to envision and we understand that as, a, as a viewer a lot of hand motion <laughs> yeah. it's just... oh yeah it's in yeah even in a 10 15 minute show it's hard for us to really sit down and explain every setup mm -hmm. you know they're all different from a mapping perspective so this should be an interesting conversation, I think. Um, and even I think even also just looking at a lot of our setups just from pans in a stand or on the ground, whatever it may be, you, you still don't really get that full perspective mm -hmm. of the surrounding area. You don't get that yep. bigger picture. I know I talk to a lot of people. My dad is one specifically. Zoom out once for me. Zoom out. So he <laughs> likes to see a wide view of yeah. everything right. rather than the small picture. So I think the mapping is going to help, of course. Yeah, and the hunt that we're going to talk about is the one that Zach and I had in Missouri last fall where we jumped the big eight pointer that ended up being found dead. Yes, they actually found him dead. We've, mm -hmm. we've got the footage of it pulled up now. Greg's watching it over there. And uh, it's where we jumped that big eight pointer out of his bed and into this creek. Once we saw this buck, uh, our strategy pretty much completely changed at that, mm -hmm. at that point, you know, because we just jumped a mature buck out of his bed. You know, Zach and I are scrambling around. We're trying to get a shot at this thing. And I'm yelling, Warp, there's a giant in the creek. <laughs> yeah, he's yelling at me, and I'm, like, trying to get a release on, an arrow knocked. Just complete and, panic. <laughs> oh, yeah, just ridiculous. But finally, I actually almost shot him. Yeah. Like, I got to full draw, and that was crazy because you were in the creek, like, 40 yards from me. <laughs> yeah, and, like, and I'm full I was draw. in the wide open, and we, we both had openings at him. But, like, mm -hmm. like you say yeah. in that video. Right there where him. he stops, where you can see him behind that tree. I was about to shoot him right there at that spot, and uh, man, just didn't, I didn't feel comfortable because I didn't know how far away it was, yep. you know, I thought it was 40 yards plus, and I didn't want to just sling one at him, yeah. right, you know, mm. but. Right decision, I, I would say. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> that buck works off, and we're going to discuss with you now 
kind of how this bedding location sets up because we're constantly talking about buck bedding and how when you find it it makes total sense why they're there well, and we can explain this better on the map when i also think what's funny and a little bit more of a background even is remember we were sitting at your dad's that night and we were, you were like i'm thinking about going over here and I, and yeah, you gave me the mouse and you're like you're gonna zoom in right to where i'm thinking of going and sure enough <laughs> we both zipped right to this spot so we can we can kind of acknowledge that theory based off of a wind direction that you know that we had the following day kind of just our thinking and how we come up with that because we and we did walk right oh yeah the we X. both looked at this exact spot that we've got pulled up right now we looked at this exact spot and we see all these habitat types converging basically what it is is it's this river bottom that butts up against some hardwood timber and some rolling hills so the river bottom's flat mm -hmm. the hills and hardwoods kind of funnel down into the river bottom at different points well right here at this at this exact location um is kind of that point where everything comes together there's the creek runs up the uh the river bottom is all flat and it's real tall and nasty there's all kinds of thick cover out there it butts up against this point of hardwood timber that runs down into the river and on the map right now we're showing you basically our strategy for the first day when we're coming in i think another main point here to to talk about is right where that buck was bedded he was on a crossing Yes, he there was. There was a very defined crossing in the river. Now, not only was there that high wall that we are going to talk about or have talked about <clears throat> kind of behind him along the river, but right there specifically, there was a major crossing that you could see that the water was shallow there. Mm -hmm. Right, and on the map right here, it looks like it's underwater, but it's actually not. It was fairly dry. We were walking right down that creek bed, and we accessed it from the south. We came up that dry creek bed, and you can, you're, most of you that have watched the footage remember when I was right up against that buck in his bed, he tore out of there and he took mm -hmm. off across the creek and he went to the southwest. He jumped into the creek, almost swam across and then popped back up on the opposite side and ended up going to the southwest out into another big thick bedding area and we didn't see him again that night. But he gave away his bedding position and it is right where we figured it would be i mean but you know the only way to know is to go in there right or set up way off of it well which, what, what our strategy was going in was to try to look for big tracks coming out of that area and i think that we had just seen a couple and we weren't overly yeah, sold we, on the spot we just saw a lot of doe and yeah, fawn, fawn tracks well, really they, we were seeing fawns up and standing in that creek confused yep. that we were coming in there but i remember we just weren't, weren't sold on it and that's you know of course when we ran them over but that day that we were going in, first day, wind was out of the north northwest, uh, might have been out of the north pretty light, and that's what we were thinking was right here at the point of these hardwoods where they come down. There's a big steep bluff that runs from the northwest to the southeast along the edge of the river, and those hardwoods form a point where they fall off into that creek bottom. Right there where all that stuff converges, hardwood timber, creek bottom, creek itself, thick willow type cover is where we assumed a buck would be bedded because the wind is blowing out of those hardwoods down to that creek crossing where they're bedded at and that buck is watching down the creek with the wind to his back. The other and thing that's... At that spot where all those habitat types converge. And he's got escape routes to basically 360 degrees yep. around him yeah, he's because... right at the point of that high wall mm -hmm. so and he, and that high wall is also acting as a barrier for predators so he knows nothing's going to come straight from the northwest of him there but he can escape in basically any direction because he's got a creek crossing right there a lot of times those deer won't bed right on the edge of the, the river if they don't have a good crossing or if it's too deep for them to cross. Yeah, a lot if it's of times. too deep, yeah. That, like, he wouldn't have been bedded, if you can see in the footage, you know, he would not have been bedded up on top of that big bluff. No, because he can't because escape. Because he can't escape that way. He's going to fall to his death if he yeah. has anybody come in from the north of him, you yeah. know. That's why he is located right there at the very base where that tip of hardwoods pours down 
And I think that that may even be why that crossing is there. You know, there's probably a lot of erosion and stuff that gets washed in off of mm -hmm. those woods um, <clears throat> where that elevation change is. And there's lots of rocks in the creek right there where they could cross. Mm -hmm. And that's where he was at when we bumped him on the first day. He runs, he goes to the southwest. You know, Zach and I back off and uh, we try to go around and get set up and run into Mr. Neon and have a, <laughs> have a pretty fun hunt in yeah. anyway. Well, we were even know. trying to essentially set up for him to circle back downwind and come back into that same bed because that is a strategy that we've we've well, used he was before. Well, back in the same bed the next day or yeah. so, at least yeah. in the same Yeah, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. But the, the real key here is that we identified this spot before we went in as potential mature buck bedding and i think both of us were kind of thinking this is almost too close to the road yeah. for a big one to be because we were seeing hunter sign all over the place on the south side of the creek mm -hmm. but we had we had marked that spot before we even went out we're like you know what we're gonna probably walk through here but there i wouldn't be surprised there's a big one there and yeah. sure enough he was there and it was set up on that wind direction perfectly mm -hmm. now fast forward mm -hmm. one day later greg's got the day two map pulled up you can see that the wind direction slightly shifted on day two uh the first day it was out of the north northwest the buck was bedded down there second day was out of the northeast but that's kind of what we look for in these spots that buck was there on a northerly wind we figured with a northeast wind it still sets up really well for him to bed in that exact spot that we just bumped him out of and the reason being is because he doesn't have to put his back in a like up against the river right so he's still looking he's still able to look down that creek with that northerly type wind yeah so once we got home the night of after the hunt on day one you know and we realized wow we have almost the same conditions tomorrow very similar wind uh how do we go in and hunt this bed again this buck that was there because we think like there's a good chance he's going to come back he hasn't been that alerted to our presence we basically just scared the heck out of him mm -hmm. and you know he didn't know what we were so we devised this plan of coming in on the second day and you can see that our access route is much different than it was on the first day basically what we ended up doing was going all the way to the west edge of the public property and going clear up and around this bedding area and if we would have took the same access path that we would have the day before, you know... Same it, same outcome. Yeah, same outcome. Bumped. We'd either bumped him or we'd have set up and the deer would have went to the north, which we'll talk about later. But this, the, the thought process here is that the buck is bedded at this point of hardwoods and they're feeding heavily on acorns during this time. Because earlier this fall, there was a good wide oak crop, mm -hmm. if, I, if I remember. Uh, yeah, right. it was insane up there. Remember, yeah. yeah, I mean, we were finding... Thousands, and we, thousands, we knew millions. that going into this hunt in Missouri. It was late September, wasn't it? Early October? It would have been. Might have been early October. No, it was the last two, two or September, three days yeah. of September. Yeah. Well, acorns were falling there. We know the deer are on them. So we think, you know, this buck is bedded at this point of hardwoods there. And the closest acorn food source that he has is right there to the north of his bed. So how do we kill him? We've got to get up on that hardwood ridge right above that bedding location. So... We access from the west edge of the property, go all the way up around this deer, cross the river, and get up on top of that hardwood ridge. And it's not a perfect wind for us necessarily. The wind is blowing just off where we can kind of get away with it blowing over the creek without alerting that deer. But, I mean, hardly though. Like it was, yeah. so in this situation, I remember we were dropping milkweed and it was just kind of sinking off to our right because we were facing towards where that buck was bedded. Yep. And it was just kind of sinking. It was off almost to our a right. crosswind. Yeah. You know, it wasn't blowing straight from the buck to us. It was a crosswind. And that's the right wind for that buck to be mm -hmm. bedded down there. You know, I mean he's still got a real good wind to be bedded there. I think it's even it's interesting even more so on the day before where the wind was coming straight from the south. I mean he's bedded straight downwind of where he's gonna walk out to feed that day. So right. he knows that there's nothing up there, you know. Right. Exactly. And uh, there was, to, to our point a minute ago, there was no big buck tracks in that creek. No. Like, no. he'd been bedding along the edge of that creek, and he may not have been using that very often. Like, he's using that as an escape. Yeah. But in the evenings for at least the last week, whenever right. you and I were walking in there, there wasn't hardly any sign. Well, what was crazy then is... And that's 15 feet from the buck. Yeah. 
You the know? other, the day prior, or then the day after. So when we went way up and around him, I mean, right away we were like, "This way he's going." Yeah. Every night because we, we got, were three hundred yards from him when we first popped up in the, up in the uh, woods there above him, and we were running into rubs, scrapes, the whole way down to where we set up. Yeah, yeah. and that's the that's the funny thing was we got up on that ridge, and. Yeah, we were just creeping down through there, just so quiet mm -hmm. and so slow. I mean, it took us, that's uh, a couple hundred yards that yeah. we walked down the center of that Yeah, ridge. we figured two, three hundred yards or whatever, somewhere in there. Yeah, and it took us forever. And there to... was, <clears throat> took us a long time to get there and then also, like, pick the spot, pick the exact spot where we felt like we were close enough. And I remember we were like, eh, could we go 20 yards further? And then we finally decided no. And then that obviously <laughs> was the wrong move. Uh-huh. We yeah. just went the extra 20 yards. We'd have got a shot at him. And you all feel free to ask questions as we're going through this stuff. We'll answer them at the, at the end. I think one um, thing to keep in mind, too, is, is the wind direction. This is all wind-based. I mean, all this decision-making is wind-based. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not a perfect win for us. But it's a perfect win for the deer. That's the main key here. It's kind of just finessing like where he thinks it's perfect for him. Yeah, the perfect win for us here is the south wind. It's blowing up the ridge out of the river Straight bottom. Away from but him. it doesn't make any sense for him to bed in the same spot the on that wind. Mature deer is not going to feel comfortable a lot of times moving straight with the wind out of his bed. No, I mean, if he's, if he's bedded there on a south wind, he's looking into the base of that ridge, and it is super thick right there. Like he, can not... see, he, can see, he can see zero yards, and he can he smell can... just what's coming up the creek he's not right. going to bed there he's not going to do it no yeah, this wind is sets up well for mm -hmm. him so zach and i are creeping through that hardwood ridge to the northwest of him and we've got a northeast wind we're seeing all that sign so we know he's been coming up there you know that bucker and other bucks mm -hmm. whoever's using that mm -hmm. bed mm -hmm. has There's been working their way up there so we decided to, to set the stand up and this is where we made our mistake we didn't go quite as far as we should have in this situation um, after, I mean, cause Jake and I have been past this bed since we were in there in November while we were hunting tore rut. Up. <laughs> yeah. It was just completely tore up with sign. There'd been bucks bedded there all month. And yeah, after this guy had been out of there. But anyway, we realized that that buck could not see very far out of that bed to the Northwest. Yeah. And you know, that's probably why he's bedded there with that wind coming from that thick stuff. But he couldn't see very far. We could have gotten within 100 yards pretty easily, but we got to right at 100 yards, and we we're just worried that the both of us trying to get stands hung and everything in pretty quiet conditions. It was really quiet conditions, yeah. if I remember right. It was. And we didn't spook anything. I mean, there was a fawn, I guess, that we kind of rubbed off on the oh, way that in. Oh, thing, that thing came <laughs> back. Remember, yeah, it was it feeding like 15 yards. It was feeding yards. 15 was... yards while we were getting the stands hung. That was... So we hung the stand 100 yards from the bed. Or at least that's what, you know, Google Earth measurements say. Um, and we and, were measuring it on the way in. Oh, yeah, we were. We were trying to get as close as we could possibly get. When we were getting there, right where we're at on the top of that ridge, we're looking down into that thick stuff. Like, we can see it. Mm -hmm. It's 60, 70 yards away, and we're like, anywhere in that transition, a deer could be bedded. Yep. And if we blow one of them out of there, we may just blow the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So we set up right there. Maybe um, just go over what the condition... I mean, it was warm that time of year. It was pretty warm. It wasn't great. I no. think we were in, yeah, like pants and a light t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably I mean, could have been shirt. Like, it was hot, mm -hmm. if I remember. Yeah, right. it, was it was 60, mid. at least 60 degrees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was fairly warm. Not a crazy good cold front or no. anything no. like that. Uh, it was just a pretty average day for that time of the year. Um, but we got set up and go ahead and pull up our our last map there, Greg. We're 100 yards from the buck when he's in his bed. And we're sitting there, and I think we had some does and stuff come out actually, of the area. I think the first, other than that fawn, I think the first deer we saw, we are like, there's some deer coming, you know, and here comes two fawns, and then a doe kind of meanders on the edge of the woods, and she goes, looks up at us for like half a second. And gone. Yeah! Get out. Yeah. <laughs> She blew out of there. I don't, she blew. She blew, and then she fair ran. Amount, and she or blew. just once? I think she a couple times. I don't think it was yeah. anything crazy, but like it was she early got when out. she came out of the bedding area, and she came from <laughs> same way that we expected him to come from. Yeah, I kind think. of. They came more out of the bottom, mm -hmm. 
out of the thick stuff to the north of where the buck was bedded. Mm -hmm. um, so the buck would have been kind of bedded downwind of those does. Yeah. But uh, they came out of there, busted us, and took off. They did not go the direction of the buck. They ran back into the bottom to the uh, east northeast and blew and carried on and everything for a while. But they uh, that was a good hour and a half almost before dark, if I remember right. It was over an hour anyway. Because, before, oh, yeah, yeah. It was a long time. Yeah. So we're sitting there kind of bummed, but at the same time, we're thinking, if we're going to kill this thing, he's going to come in here at last light. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, with about 15 minutes of legal light left, I saw something move. And, and another crazy thing about this stand setup is the trails that the does came up on just east of the stand were beat down. I mean, there was, there was fresh tracks. You could tell like that was where the majority of the deer were coming up out of there. However, that trail across the top of the ridge through the thick stuff we noticed was pretty faint, but there was mm -hmm. a bunch of fresh buck turds on. Yeah, and I mean, I remember we were like, "This is the spot." You know, we obviously this is should... the trail that he's gonna come right. Up on. And we were like, "We should be able to shoot both." And we actually got ourselves into a position where we were kind of in, you know, the triangle of the two trails. Yeah. So we, we could, were able. We to could shoot have shot both. that doe. Yeah, like, well, yes. we could have been drawn back and shooting her right when she busted us. Yeah, you know. So if that had been him, he'd have <clears> been in trouble. Yep. But he came up the quote-unquote buck trail is what we assumed it was on right towards us too. right at the stand and with 15 minutes of daylight left of legal shooting light left shall i say and uh you could actually was, see him but barely and i remember you were telling me you're like he's in there but like i can't, I can't he's see moving him so slow. slow yeah he's moving so slow at this point said, he's made it 70 yards from his bed i think you've, you even said like it may just be a raccoon. I think it's just a raccoon. No, it's a deer. That's got to be a deer. I mean, like well, that like was the kind would, of conversation I would just, we were It having. was not like the does coming up through there. You yeah. know, those does, they made 50 yards in a matter of minutes, if less than that. You know, and I heard a twig break and looked down there and I saw just maybe, it must have been a glimpse of his antlers moving through there. And it was just him putting his head down, eating acorns and lifting it back up. And then I didn't hear anything for like five, ten minutes. Like he didn't move. Yeah. He was just standing there munching on acorns in one spot. And then he took a couple of steps. And I was like, that is a deer. It's got to be a deer. But I'm telling you, it was so quiet. We could hear those does coming from 75 yeah. yards. This thing's at 20 steps. And you can barely hear him. Yeah. Because he's moving so slow. Like, he's just kind of, he'd lift his leg up and it would take him 15 seconds to take a step. <laughs> it's <was> crazy. <laughs> like, and finally, I saw him down through there. And as soon as I saw him, I was like, that's him. Like, that's that buck yeah, that we Yeah, I remember you said that. Mm -hmm. For sure. And Safe we plan. had... So when we saw yesterday. <laughs> we had, like, five minutes left, maybe ten. Yeah, maybe one. And the deer... <laughs> I was out of... I'd been out of camera light for some time. There were so many yeah. leaves on the trees. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. I guess legal light would have been after the end of camera light at that time of the year because mm -hmm. of all the leaves and stuff. But, yeah, there were still a few minutes left of legal, and he's in bow range at this point. Like, you can see on our map that we've drawn up here <clears throat> that... I've, I've drawn the buck's path of travel leaving the bed and right at the end of that dotted line is kind of where he was at at the end of legal light and he he needed to take about five six yards worth of steps to his right it'd be our left to the southeast of the stand there for me to be able to get a shot and he just didn't do it you know it just got dark and eventually right at dark we heard him lay down mm -hmm. like that thing just laid down right there mm -hmm. Like, it was the most noise that he'd made the entire time. And uh, he laid down right there at the base of the tree. So, in hindsight, with everything that we'd done up to this yeah. point, like, all the thought process that went into this, this particular hunt and getting around this deer, mm -hmm. we're 10, 15 yards away from killing. Mm -hmm. Like, if we would have moved in just a little bit closer, and you hear Dan Infall talk about that all the time, you got to be inside that 100-yard bubble when you're hunting buck beds especially early season oh yeah especially early season you can kill them obviously i mean in this thing mm -hmm. we'd have we'd have really had a good chance mm -hmm. if we'd have just moved up a little further yeah and i don't think there was really even any more risk involved like you said too the deer can't see you when they're better than that bottom and it took us to, you know obviously a little too long like once you guys went back you're like they can't see you in the bottom like it's that you know it's that simple and then mm -hmm. you know hunting around here too we we're like by the end of the season we knew that those deer <clears throat> weren't able to see us when we were coming down 
you know, even into the late season because it's so much thick vegetation. Yep. But mm -hmm. I think our confidence at that time of the year, you know, hunting a new area, we just didn't yep. expect we didn't, them to... We didn't know the area quite well enough to have the confidence to go in another 20 yards. Yep. And we could have. Yep. And that's what that's what really eats yeah. at me. You know, it's yeah. like me and Jake were in there and we're sitting there looking at that bed in <laughs> early November and we're like, dang it. We could have got like 50 yards oh, closer. Yeah. Easy. yeah, we were down there in November and you still couldn't see anywhere near where you guys were set up. Yeah, there. I mean, so we got to 100 yards and it just wasn't quite far enough. But you see at on the map, we've also drawn up where the hunting pressure is at on this piece and yeah. there's lots of hunters on this place mm -hmm. and that that buck is bedded right up against the creek both nights in a row on northerly winds he's not going to the south right across that creek 100 yards away is where mr neon was sitting mm -hmm. you know that day he told us he was coming back mm -hmm. yeah he, he was, was sitting there. there he was there again yeah like that day yeah. and that buck is not going that direction because he smells humans that way that's the direction mm -hmm. where he encounters people and we've got the hunting pressure arrows drawn on here. Mm -hmm. All across the south side of that creek is where people hunt. Mm -hmm. I think and that's the only way that public access is, mm -hmm. is to the south yes, there. Yes, yes. I think another... And that was another thing, like, our, our access on this day, we had to crawl up a rock block. Yeah, yeah, yeah and there. we were bleeding and going through thick <laughs> stuff. Like, it was, it was... Yeah, we were pretty miserable about halfway through. But I think another thing that, you know, if, if I guess... We keep saying that we were going in, you know, after this buck and because that's the buck we came yeah, through. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily true. That's an area that we, you know, we saw enough as, as, as soon as we were up on that ridge coming from the oaks down to where we eventually set up. We were like, bucks bed here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And mature bucks. Mm -hmm. well Not used, just him. Well used buck. Well, after we had the fall we did there, I mean, we saw several other mature bucks Seems in like the area. Every, yeah. every time we went out, we would see a different mature buck. Yeah, and oh. that was one of their core mature buck bedding areas yep. like we just it was a good chance we were going to see him again mm -hmm. because of the nature of which we spooked him you right. know he wasn't he didn't see what we were and a lot of times he'll come right back to that bed because they were just startled by something and they well, don't think, know what it was and that's what happened in this case but it's that's another thing with these buck bedding areas um once a mature buck leaves that spot another one will come right back yeah. in there well like, i think another reason at least from my perspective that gave us enough comp gave me the confidence to go right back after it was like the nebraska thing fairly oh, yeah. similar setup mm -hmm. you know you bump them out of there mm -hmm. and then you go back in a couple days later and there mm -hmm. you know there's that same deer yeah and i think that you know you just hear so much that you got to stay out of a bedding area and we and we i know we harp on this a obviously lot obviously we're not going like three four days in a row right no when we're going you, in for the kill. Yeah. Like, and we missed it by just that much. And then we move on, you yeah. know, I guess. Yeah. And, and from a different, you know, a different hunting situation where you're hunting private land, you, you pick those, or, or a small property, or even a small piece of public property, whatever it may be, you, you make that decision to go in there for that kill on the day that you have the most confidence with the yep. right conditions. Yep. You know, luckily for us, we have enough you know, places to go scout that we can go for the kill when it's 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, second That's kind of what season. we did there. Yeah. Second yeah. day of season in Iowa, it was 80 degrees and Jake and I are crawling to where we found a bunch of buck beds mm -hmm. in the summer, yeah. you know, <laughs> like trying to get within a hundred yards of it. Yeah. It's just, uh, and that's just the thing though, too. We got within a hundred yards of this buck. He comes in, lays down. We pull the stands down with him laying there 15 steps <laughs> and it took us with the lights on, you know, it took us forever. We're just standing there, shining our lights on each other as we're handing each other the, the sticks and the stands and everything, just going so slow. It took us an hour and a half to get out of there. There's a good question there, the bottom one. I but think eventually we, we did get down, and after we got down, we heard him get up, and he walked right yeah, by us. Yeah. You know, we, were, we just killed the lights, we just stood there, and you can just hear him walk right by us and right up the ridge where we had come in from. Yeah, it's so, yeah, I mean, he was close, like really close. And there was other deer as we were taking the stands down, milling around that you could hear back up on the ridge, higher up eating acorns and stuff. And and I know it sounds crazy, but if you really take your time, I promise you can do it. Mm -hmm. You just gotta like. Well, you, like that thing went right by us. He had no yeah. idea we were even in the world. If you make the, you know, like a ting or something, you know, just stop. Stop. And just be patient you're gonna for make a couple a of minutes. Oh yeah. yeah, you're gonna make noise, no doubt about it. I remember. That, that's the thing. Consecutive noise mm -hmm. is what they pick up on. One. 
out of place sound yeah. isn't going to blow the whole deal most right. times. And in this situation, it's early season. They haven't seen a ton of pressure. It makes me think yet. when Luke killed that big buck this year, what the noise that we heard to make us turn around to see that buck was in the, when that buck jumped over a barbed wire fence. So I mean, yeah, he animals, the are, fence. animals are making that. Those yeah, and right. when they when they hear those noises yeah. or any noise, the twig break in the wild, mm -hmm. you'll just see them whip that head over and stare in that direction for a, a, at least several mm -hmm. seconds, several yeah. minutes if it's a mature buck yeah. sometimes. A mature doe, too. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, same way. But that's... they eventually give up on it, otherwise they'd be stuck in concrete all the time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's what always <clears throat> makes me laugh. It's like questions on yeah, he's got a, yeah. Jake's um, got a good one here. Got one on Instagram that says, do you think if the buck would have saw you guys, would you have went back and hunted him right away? It, referring to the Missouri buck, because you guys, he, 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 you kind of caught him off guard and he hopped across the creek and didn't really act like he knew what happened. I think we'd have hunted that bedding area again, yeah. regardless. Because like we said. Cause that we, buck that we jumped in Nebraska that you ended up killing, this one? Oh, uh, he's over here. Right there, that one. Um he he knew that you were a oh, human yeah. being. Like he he for sure saw you and smelled you. Mm -hmm. We were trying to wind bump it, and what was it? Two three days later, we were in there. I think two days we were in there. Third day, shot him. But did we go back the next day? I'm pretty sure we did. It might have been two days. I think I think wind bump, wait a day, okay, hunt and then kill. Okay, but yeah, he was there three days later. Yep. Which yeah, I mean, and like we said. More bucks will move in there. A different buck could be in there the next day. If there's enough of them around. Yeah, yeah. if there's enough of them around. If you're hunting one specific buck and, you know, he tears out of there and, mm -hmm. and he sees you, smells you, and then maybe not. Mm -hmm. But in our case, we're pretty opportunistic, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it could have been, you know, that buck's <laughs> there's a, there's grandson like a, that came in and I'd have probably yeah. shot him. <laughs> there's like a mentality, too, of like the deer. Or I don't know. I, I, I don't know if mentality, but... Just watching their body language is generally enough for us to give us enough confidence or not. Like, there was a time, I think in 2016, I was with Preston, where I shot that one in 15. Yep. And we are going in, and there was a place that we thought, you know, bucks might bed. Sure enough, we pop out of the river too close to it, and he saw us, and he got out of there. Yeah, he like, tore he out. He ran so fast and like, nah, that, that one didn't not going at that eight pointer not, at all. Well, right, not going back and hunting that deer. Like he, yeah. like he won't be there for a couple of days after that. But on the other hand, even that buck that we saw when we were, um, oh, when we were going in with the decoy that that one morning, yeah, he saw and knew something was wrong. But it was because we didn't have enough cover. He bounded he, away like this and then stopped and then took some more around and, and Yeah, they don't know what he happened. Didn't, he didn't put his head down and just dart out of there. Wow. And never you can that. tell. I mean, yeah, I've bumped him before where <laughs> you spook him and you're, you're like, him, holy cow, yeah, is that that deer, really that dot over him. there, like two miles away, still running? <laughs> yeah, that happens. And then when that happens, you know, it's probably time to start over. Yeah. <laughs> but, we got some more questions on that. Uh, all right, what do you... Did you find issues with thermals along the water... Did we find do issues you, do with... You, do you find issues with thermals along water features near sunset? Uh, sometimes I would say that yeah. the water, if it's moving fast enough too. Now, this is a stream that's it's, not really moving It was much. really dry. Like most, I mean, there's there were spots in that creek where there was no water. Our, wasn't our area faster. in general, though, compared to like, like where in southern Missouri, I know you'd get it in Wisconsin, you get it definitely in Ohio, you get it. Like where you get that actual like moving mm -hmm. stream... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sometimes gonna play. They'll suck it down. Yeah, that's gonna play more. Mm -hmm. So than like in even Northern though when Missouri you have a Iowa. pond or you have a lake or a river in this situation that's more stagnant and still, once that temperature starts falling mm -hmm. and lasts light, that water will still pull. Mm -hmm. Like you'll still get that ther that light thermal pull into the water. I learned that from Dan too. Mm -hmm. He's got video of it in one of his hunts. Mm -hmm. You know where he's dropping milkweed and it's going into the mm -hmm. into the pond. It's like bathtub water, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. I think we had some footage of that too this year. Yes, we where, did. Where me and you hunted along the river there, and it just kind of sucked right down into the river. Yep, yep. And in this situation, I don't think we were far enough from the edge of the river. We were like up a giant bluff, yeah, and forty yards from the edge of the bluff. Yeah. Still, I don't think we were getting any thermal pull. Uh, related to this Missouri buck here, did you guys try to or want to find out where he was bedding on different winds, like a south wind or any other wind? I think we were just generalizing other bedding locations, not necessarily him, but he would probably use some of those bedding areas that we see. Like, like when we, our thought process, when we go into the, looking at that spot is just like, that's this, you know, that's our favorite spot for a North wind. We yeah. Cause that, the that same day thing we're for, like, okay, we got a North wind. Where's the best locations for the North wind. 
and we're thinking that is one of the best spots. And we actually found another one that was further up in the timber yep. there that we didn't even get to because yep. we bumped that buck. Um, then later on in the fall, Jake and I went back in there and we had a west wind. So we ended up hunting further to the east about a mile or so. Yeah. And we were basically hunting the same habitat features that this buck was baiting in the eight pointer, you know, except on the opposite side. Yep. And, 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 uh, and yeah, there thing. was buck in there. We almost, we saw a big one that morning yeah. too. And, and you got to think of our situation too. Our situation is, you know, we've got this one big river bottom and we're looking at it for, you know, maybe our favorite spots are only north winds. So on a south wind, we may be three miles down yeah, the river. Yeah, we may go to a totally different, different area. Yep. Same thing goes for a small piece of private land. Like, for for example, one of the places that I grew up in, my, my grandpa's farm, I grew up hunting it. Most of the deer bed there on a west on that property on a westerly or northerly type wind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're not hunting there on a south wind. Yeah, I or mean. east wind. Well, well, we probably did too much when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't, none there. of us knew any right. of this stuff. Then. So, to... to, to you know, don't, don't like, think about your setup, you know, maybe it, as sad as it may be, your setup may only set up for mm -hmm. bucks to bed there on a west wind. Especially on a small property. Small like property. Yeah. Eight, not this saying is an 80 some acre. other things can happen that could possibly get a big one in front <clears throat> yeah. of you. They yeah, can, yeah, but... and there's rut situations that are totally oh, yeah. different. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm talking from the perspective of, um, you know, buck just bedding up, buck all bedding. the rest of the year except yeah. for the rut. Yep. And in this river bottom spot where that big eight pointer's at, we noticed through the rest of the hunts that we had throughout the fall, most of the best buck bedding was right along the river mm -hmm. where those crossings are mm -hmm. yep. for various winds. Mm -hmm. You know, it was never a wind blowing from the river to the river bank. Mm -hmm. It was always coming from the land side, blowing out across the river. What else you got? Uh, nothing related to that Missouri hunt, just some speed round stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, we need to get into shed hunting. Yeah. Greg's telling us we need to get moving here. We've been talking about this for a while. But, uh, yeah, Jake and Brody were out yesterday. Yep. Is it yesterday already? Oh, yeah. Yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Found a couple, couple bones. Yeah. This is Big Boy, and uh, this is also Big Boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which one did you find? Which one Brody found? Found this one. And uh, Brody found this one, obviously. Thought it might be a match set at first, but... The bases are completely different. Mine has way bigger bases than Brody's. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're both really nice to you. Yeah, yeah, I mean that thing's wicked cool. Yeah, we had we had a good day yesterday. Where, where did you to find them at exactly? Uh, so I don't know. We just kind what of what were the coordinates of that? No, I mean, I mean like, <laughs> that's what of, it sounds like. What type of terrain? I was talking to Zach before we went out and like basically mentioned all the spots I wanted to go, and he's like, nope, nope. I'm like, where can we go that you don't want to go? So, like, me and Brody just went down to an area that's closed for most of the year until duck season closes, then it yeah. opens up to deer hunting. And you guys... We've hunted it. You've before. hunted it, but you don't seem to scout it a lot, as no. well, from what we've talked about, because you can only hunt it for a couple of weeks right. out of the it's year. Right, it's not so a like, main bow focus. Well, Brody, these are probably going to be good spots to go, because, like, there's probably a lot of deer there, first of all, and, like, like I said... Well, you there's guys, deer that don't get hunted. Exactly. Like, like a week exactly. out of every season. Yeah, you know? so well, the whole chance. late season. Yeah. Just the late season, I guess, yeah. is yeah. when they get So hunted. I knew our chances would be good to maybe find a shed, I guess. So, I don't know, we are just driving around, and so it looked good to us, and we, we, saw that, we saw that there was fields, and we were just curious to see if they were standing in anything or if the DNR had planted anything, and sure enough, there was cornfields on both sides of the public, and, like, all the bedding is square in the middle of these two cornfields. And we just came walking off the cornfield down off the, it kind of drops into the river bottom there. Mm -hmm. And so you basically have corn on top, yep. then you have a side hill of hardwoods. Yep. Yep. And it drops off hundred yards wide. And then it drops yep. into pretty steep drops off into like the nastiest river. Marsh. Or lake bottom. It's not really even hardwoods though. It's more of that brushy. Yeah. I kind of noticed that. It's like kind of a brushy, yeah. you know, young, yeah, yeah for there, there are oaks in there too. Yeah, but yeah, like it's not. Were huge these deer bedded in there? Or were they no, transitioning? I couldn't. I mean, so there's there was those. I guess what I would call them is the nighttime beds where they're feeding on that cornfield. Then they just like lay down and chew on their cud, basically like right. a cow would, you know. Yeah. But there wasn't a ton of beds. Most of the beds were down in the bottom, and that's where we jumped. As I was gonna say, we jumped. What was it? Four or five bucks yesterday, bro. That so. all still had their antlers, but. We got some good scouting done, and yeah. then we, we learned where 
Bucks like to bet in that bottom, obviously. So I think that's something that I'd like to yeah. like to yeah. talk about a little bit. I, I, I'll say this first. Obviously, this is public land that we're going on. Yes. And other people have access to it, right. obviously. So we just want to get out there as much as we can. Yes. Like, people could walk it any time of the year. We know it's a different situation if you have private land right. or just a spot that you can control that nobody else can That's go what into. I was gonna say. We wouldn't do the same thing there, but this is public land. We just want to get out and scout and then hopefully we pick up a couple of these but exactly yeah. more and importantly think, we found where bucks were bedded like yeah. that's gonna that's what's gonna help us kill deer next fall and that that isn't gonna help you kill the no. deer what finding the buck bed is going to though and you know the thing the thing like jake was just saying that's that we get a lot of questions of when should we start scout you know shed hunting on public land honestly today because <laughs> yesterday you know if, if you weren't on you know if you wait too shed many days around here it's like ultra competitive yeah and we're not we're we don't really and it, and it get is, too well and it's crazy going to about be, it but it's going to be in another state even mm -hmm. more so yeah. so for example your your states like obviously like pennsylvania michigan wisconsin missouri ohio yeah Nebraska, but like whatever. we get a lot of people that travel down here that don't have tags well, and I, and they come down here just to go shed right and i and i would agree know? but point being is is there there's no shed police out there mm -hmm. right you know no. there's nobody saying you can't go so get out there scout and just have some fun you know that's what that's what shed hunting mm -hmm. is all about is scouting learning something new and having fun yeah. with your buddies out in the woods it's a time frame where you can go out yeah and the learn weather's been perfect the last few days for walking you know it's 40s 50s <clears throat> yeah. during the day yeah. it's perfect walking and something weather. i'll say is we didn't learn anything from finding these two sheds but you can learn a lot from finding sheds in beds I yeah mean, that's basically just giving away. I mean, we learn a lot from finding deadheads. Yeah, too. exactly. And just or anything, finding them in like odd ball food sources yeah. too. Like, like you know, let's say we would have never found our, you know, buck nest, our second buck nest there, mm -hmm. and we'd just stumble out into that bottom yeah. of that duck potato and find a bunch of sheds. We'd be like, oh man, mm -hmm. they're eating this Me stuff. Me and Brody, heavy. yesterday when we were walking, I was telling you guys about it, but it's. It was planted in the CRP maybe three, four years ago, it looks like, when you look at the old maps or whatever, but it's just clover grown up into the CRP field, and there was deer feeding in there heavy. And I'm, I'm, I think that's probably a spot a lot of people don't know about unless mm -hmm. you've been walking around down in there. Yep. Yeah, I mean, great finds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure, dude. So let's, let's get those little guys up there. Yeah. I like those, too. Yeah. Yeah. One of, tell them about that one. This one we found on the road. <laughs> We were driving pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, you want to turn around and go get that antler? We were actually, we actually were only yeah. about a, we were not too far from the public. No, no. Actually, we were going from. It was probably the closest bedding habitat to where we found the shed, actually. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Like, you always hear about people wanting to find road sheds, mm -hmm. and like, this is a literal on the road mm -hmm. shed. This might have popped somebody's people. tire. Yeah. <laughs> we found them off the road before, too. Mm -hmm. Just like slam on your brakes, like, <laughs> what was that? Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. But I'm excited to go tomorrow again and try to help. Yeah, Ted, we'll Ted go down there up. with Ted. I bet we're gonna learn something. Huh? <laughs> is there any is there any questions about uh, shed, shed hunting, hunting that we uh, have? need to get to? Um, we also have another video journal that should be up fairly soon about. Uh, basically, it's one of our big timber spots. Mm -hmm. Zach, you were scouting yeah. it the other day, and you and Greg had a good hunt in there. If you I think Greg's gonna pull up some of the footage from that buck that you saw. Yep. On sometime in late who look at that glove. October thirtieth was October thirtieth? Yep. We went in and we were um hunting a big ridge top and it ran parallel to some, you know, big bottom ag fields. Mm -hmm. And this area has a bunch of big timber in it compared to most of the areas that we hunt. And the strategy going in was just trying to hunt bucks back in the timber where they would be crossing doe trails. So basically just crossing from where the does are feeding to where they're bedding, crossing their trails, trying to find a hot doe. In that spot, does are feeding north to south? Yep. They're or, going, or I guess they're feeding it feed to bed, bed to feed is north to south, south to north. Yep. So and this buck, this buck's a big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's big, one of the biggest ones I saw all year, mm -hmm. if not yeah. the biggest. And I think, um, it, well, and actually, it's also the same strategy uh, that we were using when we, Jake and I shot that yeah. one back in, on November 13th. Basically the same thing, um, just evening setup. So we were um, 
basically. You were hunting the food side. Yeah, mm-hmm. hunting the food side more so than the bed side. And, yeah, in this video that we're working on right now, we've... Been we've, in there before. Yeah, and we've walked, we've been in there before, we scouted it before, hunted here, I've probably hunted here in the last two years, maybe five times, six times, I would say. And after several major failures, <laughs> realized what was going on back there. But basically the deer are just coming from, like Aaron said, the food to their beds and they're bedding on secondary points off of the main ridge. And the way it sets up, there's pretty straightforward lines the way the ridge runs in comparison to the fields. Mm-hmm. And the deer are just going straight up and over that main ridge from north to south. And they're bedding on the, the south, south side, side of the main ridge. Uh, with the north, the north, north wind. wind. Mm-hmm. Yes, sorry, with the north wind. And this wind. buck is cruising the tops of those ridges, basically. Mm-hmm. Yep. And when we went back and we scouted it again, we picked several different setups along the way. Mm-hmm. And it also... He's not going... Is he going right down the highest point of the ridge, or is he's he at, well, right on the side? He actually hill? did go right across the top because yeah. he ran into that doe's trail. But something oh, that I, I was going to talk about real quick, too, and it's harder to dive in. I didn't dive into it in the uh, video, so now would probably be a good time to do it. And I, I think I've talked about it before. But here in Iowa, in, in, a lot, in really a lot of this area around here, I think even, like you've said, in Wisconsin, and I know in Nebraska, uh, a lot of Missouri, there's never really, like, maybe southern Missouri that changes, but you're always, like, on top, you're flat, mm-hmm. if that's making any sense. So the highest point is never going to fluctuate that much no. where sometimes in you know other areas steeper other areas, areas it's gonna you're gonna yeah. have a elevation point yeah. that changes a lot more right like our highest elevation more is hills whatever and... it is you know yeah. so in this situation they're doing the same thing that they do in um bigger hills but it's but it's way more extreme in the in the bigger hills they're going from you've got a ridge top that's running west east to and, east east yep. to west and then you've got those little secondary ridges that are running north and south off of that main ridge. In between those secondary ridges, there's a little valley. And that, in bigger hills, creates a saddle, which is two high points. And then in between those two high points, there's a low point where those two valleys meet up. And the deer are doing the same thing here. They're, the does, especially, are coming up in the morning, and they're going through those valleys going over, you know, where the saddle would be in bigger timber. Right. And then they're going off and betting on one of those secondary points. The bucks are cruising across the top side. They're hitting those trails yes. that they're coming in on. So in a, in a bigger timber, or not a bigger timber, a bigger hill or more extreme terrain, you're really going to find those crossing trails in those saddles. So saddles are huge, especially like in southern Ohio. But if you're hunting a cruising buck, like this. Yeah. He's not following the, I guess, your main deer travel right. that's going through those saddles. That that main deer travel is all those does. Mm-hmm. He is crossing those things. Right. And, and that's exactly of, what he does here. I mean, he yeah. crosses them, and you can see him putting his nose down there and, like, hitting those trails. And eventually and he, he hit, hits the... He hit our trail, and he went right <laughs> the wrong way. Unfortunately for you guys. Yeah. I think, it, just to talk about a different uh, ha- type of habitat where they're doing the same thing is along the river... The, most of those deer were betting on the other yeah. side of the river where the river we were is at, a great example. and they, they were crossing the river because it wasn't very deep to feed on the other side. Most of the does, like you said, but we were hunting right along the river, and all the cruising activity was right along the side of the river. Here's a simple way to put it, I guess, and and I was I think I was explaining it to Greg, and and we decided this may be the most basic form to explain it. Think about a field edge. You got a hard line, right? And deer trails go straight perpendicular to that edge. <laughs> There's scrapes. There's always a scrape right at the edge of the field, right where that doe trail or deer trail comes in. Yep. And it's if you watch a buck making scrapes along a field edge, he's crossing doe trails. And he stops at those scrapes, scent checks it, and either, <laughs> either goes back into the bedding area or goes out into the food source wherever the deer, you know, the deer, whatever time frame Yeah, but that's is. what they rely on is their nose. Yep. That's how they figure out their world mm-hmm. every single day. And that's, that's exactly what they're doing. It forms an X pattern, yeah. kind mm-hmm. of. You know, I mean, you, and that's the, that's why setting up on the heaviest sign can sometimes be a trick. Yeah. You know, especially, oh, yeah, for sure. You just see a bunch of does and young bucks. Right, right. Yeah. Because they're they're hitting that 
that solid you know trail or whatever that has all those tracks on it but that that perpendicular trail that we're talking about like a field edge or whatever in this case it's the side of that ridge is very faint yeah like you'll see a, a couple of rubs every time to where be, they hit one of those trails you'll see a rub yeah. or, or you'll like, see a scrape yeah like and to, and to be honest it's kind of weird it's not it's not even like a you know, you can't walk it's right not even down like one a trail. trail. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like there's a little trail here and there's a little trail. They just yards kind of down. meander from one trail to the other. We were walking but, where Zach shot his buck the other day, and there's no trail where that buck came. Yeah, from. yeah. I mean, we couldn't even find yeah. the specific trail he yeah. was on. I would bet you though he's walked in that same yeah. spot yeah. before. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You know, like if you put a trail camera up in that spot, mm -hmm. you might, might get be the one occasional of the deer, deer that walks through there, but he might be the only one you pick up. You might give a picture of him a week for the entire month of October. It's at three in the morning. It's know? a pretty cool setup, and it's really like for a cruising buck situation. I think it, you know, you're going to see, you're likely going to see more bucks than you would in like a very defined funnel, you know, yeah. because there's obviously a really specific reason they're crossing where does specifically are coming from bed to food. Yep. Well, we better get to the speed round, boys. Speed How round. much time we got left, Greg? It's Ten minutes. A speed Ten round. minutes? Yeah, he said that pretty fast. Brody, you ready for the speed round? Yep. Nine minutes and 35 seconds. It's not too many right now. Okay. Uh, Let's how, get to it. How many uh, buck beds, or how many beds do you think a mature buck has? Mm. Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> really? Deal. Yeah, that's that's going to be a hard one for a speed round. But we're, we're trying to capture one and put a collar on it so we can figure it out. <laughs> I think that my opinion is on it is depends on your area, depends on the pressure, but some areas, like, they could have 100 some areas they might have seven you know right just depends on the buck and depends on pressure in the situation and food sources how far from where you you guys jumped that buck in missouri was he found dead do you remember what the guy said he it? said it was about 300 yards okay. they did find that buck dead if nobody i think we've mentioned that on a previous mm -hmm. podcast or video mm -hmm. And they found that big eight pointer him. dead and he was out in that river bottom 300 yards or so away from how that, can you tell uh, the spot? How, how can you tell the difference between buck beds and doe beds? Does bed in like a circular fashion a lot of the time because mm -hmm. they rely on their eyesight to save one another and they're always, more times than not, they're bedded in a social group. Mm -hmm. Now, a buck bedding area could still have a bunch of beds in it, mm -hmm. but right. they're usually bigger. We're not, got, we're not saying it's specifically a no, buck a doe will bed. A doe will bed in a right. buck bed. Mm -hmm. Like, they will if the buck's not there, I think which so. you can tell by... I was watching some footage back and we found a bed and you said perfect a buck bed's here sometimes mm -hmm. and that's all that's really all that we're looking for is that one bed's there a sometimes buck, a There's, buck turd in the bed sometimes there'll be rubs be there, rub. there, there won't always be a rub even mm -hmm. though but buck turds are, are just tracks going out of you can tell by going. the size of it to a certain yep. extent and tracks that are in and around that location and then how the bed is set up for the wind you know does won't bed like that not i mean not necessarily not They're necessarily not relying they, on it like right. bucks are. They won't bed like that uh, some of the time, but bucks bed like that almost all the time. How many times do you typically scout uh, a piece of public land before you hunt it? Sometimes zero, sometimes like... That Missouri piece we not scouted one time when yeah. we bumped him, you know, and then we almost killed him the next day. Only with maps. Yeah, yeah. Well, only, only with, with maps. maps. Yeah, sorry. But some places, yeah, we scout them multiple times. And the more you can, the better, especially this time of year. What percentage of bucks do you think have shed? And this is a very area specific question, I think. Why don't you guys answer that one? We've been you driving saw, around a lot. You saw bucks yesterday. You and Brody yeah. did with antlers. We yeah. figured we're, somewhere around fifty. Just from us driving around, and we've seen a lot of bucks that have shed. But like I said, that's just our area. I know around home you can drive around, go one mile one way, and all the bucks are still holding. Go one mile the other way, and all the bucks have shed. So that's kind of a just crapshoot, I yeah. think. Either drive around or run trail cameras to give you the best idea in yeah. your area, I would yeah. say. Public land stands, hang on or climber? Depends on where you're at. Here, hang on. If there's a lot of straight trees. Straight trees. Down in the south or, yeah, even out where you guys southern are at. Ohio. Ohio. I would, in southern Ohio, I would use a climber. When you hunt in the mornings, are you already thinking that the buck is bedded or are you planning on him coming back into that bed? Either or. Yep. It kind of depends. Both. That one that me and Sean killed... Um, on the 30th in 2016, the one that was down in the swamp, he was coming out of the beds at 8 o'clock in the morning to hit some scrapes on the downwind side of the bedding area. 
the buck that we shot in Nebraska, we literally could hear him in the bedding area mm-hmm. when we were setting the stand up, heard him bed down, and then he got up and came. We were just in the bedding area in that situation. So, And that and, goes back to taking your time when you're setting up the stand and making noise because obviously we were making a little bit of noise, but then we'd stop and just listen for that buck, mm-hmm. and yeah. he was never even... Many times if you're, uh, if you're right up next to the bed, they're close. Like if it's at first light, they're they're either in it or they're really really close. How much do you guys rely on topo maps, and what do you look for if you do? We rely on those a fair amount, especially in the hillier mm-hmm. stuff. Even if it's not though, I think even just a subtle rise can really yeah. make a difference. Like where Zach shot his buck, there's a couple just mounds basically in this marsh, and they're mm-hmm. they're just trampled down with beds where the deer can just get a little bit of an advantage. When you're looking at hilly terrain in the rut, for example, you're looking for the leeward side of hills. And you can see that on topo map. Explain leeward. Leeward is the downwind side of the hill. So if you're standing on top of the hill that runs north and south, you have a west wind. The east side of the hill is the leeward side. Yep. And bucks will cruise, you know, that, well, a lot of folks say that one-third elevation line or that military crest, especially out in, in Ohio where you've got steeper terrain. They'll cruise that, but they, I mean, they don't necessarily do that in every situation. However, you do notice them cruising somewhere on that leeward side Mm -hmm. with that wind. What can they expect from you guys for turkey season? Oh, we'll be doing all kinds of turkey stuff. (laughs) Hopefully a lot of gunshots. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. We'll be doing all kinds of turkey stuff. Getting muddy. Public a bunch. Not showering a lot. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> we'll probably go on some trips, some out of state trips, maybe go down south again. I really want to go down to Alabama and hunt yeah, public yeah. down there. I mean again. we did we wanted to last year, but you know. We do we were in Mississippi and Arkansas. We could um Yeah. Like yeah. last year I didn't I went eleven days, that was Mississippi. What do you think we can get more than that this year? You, you mean showerless days? Yeah. Yes. We could potentially. I don't know if I want to. They say after a month that you just like stop smelling bad. Your body just cleans. We itself. were we were so primitive in Mississippi last year. Like we'd we run out of batteries for Arkansas. the lights and everything. We were just crouched on the ground next Eating. to this little fire, like just taking pieces of bread and putting a knife and peanut butter in Nebraska there. Nebraska was pretty good this year too. Yeah, we were, Nebraska we was pretty. Was pretty ex- yeah, primitive. yeah. It was survival mode. Once you get past you know day seven or eight and you it's run fun. out of food, you just eat peanut butter the funny, and bread. The, one of the funniest things McDonald's. about camping and hunting is the the crouch and eat. Like, you just kind of like are crouched in your own little. Area. You don't have a chair. No, <laughs> or silverware. So you just got to hunt and eat in your hand. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, pretty much. Cool. When faced with trees that are less than perfect for stands, would you rather stay close in a subpar tree or move a little farther away into a better location? Oh, if you're bow hunting, you have to be where you have to be. I'd answer that question for someone that's probably hunting by themselves, though, too. uh, I mean, a lot of times you can get in a less than ideal tree as far as cover and be okay if you're hunting by yourself, but we have two people to hide up in the tree, obviously. Yeah, and that is more difficult. Just hide hide on the back side of the tree from where you... I can't tell you. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, we set up in a perfect tree... It w- we got set up in great, but if there was a little crooked tree 30 yards ahead of us, well, that's the one we should have been yeah. in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because that's the one we would have killed oh, a buck mm-hmm. out of. We didn't kill him out of the perfect tree, yep. if that tells you anything. It's not always the case, but you want to be where, like, you, you'll you know where you need to be to get an ethical shot at that trail, or whatever it is. When a mature buck gets up from his bed, will he walk into the wind, or do you think, regardless of the wind, he will have a specific destination? No, they'll leave regardless. Um, doesn't really matter. They, they've got, usually where that bed is, they have all kinds of destinations, like a bicycle wheel spokes from that spot. You know, they may have water to the south, they may have acorns to the west, they may have ag fields to the east, they may have does to the north. And depending on the time of the year and what they're keying in on, that's going to depend on where you want to set up. In the, the instance of the buck in Missouri earlier, he was going to the northwest onto the acorns. You know, if it was rut, he could have been going to the east into the doe bedding. But, yeah. Have you guys used the bump and dump method when hunting a certain buck? Not hunting a certain buck. Man, more or less that one, because that's the one oh, yeah, I'm pretty so. sure that ran out of there. Yeah. That, and, was, that was a bump and dumper. Yeah. But that was a bump and dump him a few days later. Yeah. Like, we almost bumped and dumped one last year that day. 
Yeah. Remember that at, yeah. down at the marsh? When yeah, we should. Yeah, place. and we should have if we'd we, been on we top. We were going of our down game. through there, and we bumped a big one and a small buck and a doe, and they didn't have any idea what happened. And me and Zach are sitting there looking for trees, and we're like, you know what? We should probably be ready because he can <laughs> pop up at any. Wait a minute, there he is. <laughs> you know, well, and we was, look up and like he's at thirty yards coming back. Matt's in. Matt's got to split away right. from his doe. Yeah, that's a situation where he's split from his doe that's hot that he's bedded with. There's a little satellite buck bedded beside him. he didn't him. have a clue. She just he got He came back spooked. twice. Twice. Yeah. He came back that, that time when we should have killed him. Mm -hmm. After we'd spooked him. And, I mean, within 15 minutes he came back. Yep. yep. He, he saw us busted out of there. Then we got the stands hung and right at dark, he popped out about 100 yards from us blowing and stomping, you know. Yep. He was, uh, yeah, it was interesting to watch him because he wanted to be back in there. He didn't know what the heck we were and wanted to find that doe. That's it. All right. I got a question for you guys. If Jake holds this antler and I hold this antler and we fight, who's going to win? Mm. Leave it in the comments below. Yeah. Let us know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you.